And now we are going to move on to Juliet. Juliet Curie is one of our doctoral candidates, but as I've already said, Juliet is far more than that to the Da Vinci Institute um, because she's one of our associate faculty members. Um, she also is a master's alumnus of the Institute and now soon to be, hopefully, Juliet, a doctoral alumnus. And um, I always say Juliet founded Metro Minds, which is a national accredited training provider. But if I were to describe her, I would say that she encompasses passion, entrepreneurship, um, mixed with her absolute love of education and her passion for her own area of expertise and um, passion, which is in the freight forwarding, in the logistics, in the transport sector, etc. She has won multiple awards. And I always say um, when you win boss of the year, then you must know um, that you really are a pretty impressive um, boss because most people don't like their bosses, Juliet. And um, in 2021, she was voted as one of the top 100 most influential supply chain women in Africa. And I really think that um, her mixture of a jovial approach and an absolute lively characteristic that she has when you see her speak, coupled with her academic knowledge and her business acumen, really makes Juliet an agile, aligned and engaged managerial leader already. And we can't wait to see your contribution of your doctoral study. So um, if I could please ask that what I will ask Juliet is to just sort of start going through. If you've got any questions, feel free to pop them in the comment box because our students um, tend to be a little bit more nervous, even though Juliet presents every day. Um, when it's your own study, it is a little bit nerve wracking. So I just want to let her get through the bulk of telling you what her problem statement is, um, what she intends to do, how she intends to do it, um, and also what she hopes to get out of it. Because remember that the purpose of today is all of your expertise to offer Juliet some comments, some critiques, some suggestions that she can take forward on her doctoral journey. So ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you um, Juliet Faree, who will be presenting her doctoral topic today. Thank you, Juliet. Over to you. Thanks so much, Marla. Um, it's always, you know, yeah, you can just take Marla anywhere because she just makes you feel good. So thank you so much for that very colorful introduction and for the opportunity to share my study and uh, today and being surrounded by so many curious professionals and academics. Uh, Curiosita is such a wonderful opportunity for students and for community and for business. To highlight, um, I almost want to say what Albert Einstein said once, say that I really have no special talents. I'm just passionately curious. So um, I think, uh, yeah, without further ado, I'll just start with maybe what I want to achieve um, through my study. And, you know, to, in terms of a problem statement, I, I, I rather want to say what, what first I want to achieve. Um, in terms of my background and the context, is I, um, I come from the freight forwarding and customs clearing uh, sector, and that is where I grew up in terms of a career. So skills development has always been a passion of mine, and I always look through a human lens to say, what does the future hold? What's the skills development? What are the things that we can do to make, make um, this life better? And we're definitely through education, as we know. So the, that's where the freight forwarding sector comes in. Um, but really, more than that is that we are in a uh, environment where freight forwarding and customs is not oftenly spoken about as a career of choice. Although the nature of it is very fast paced, there's 24 7 demands. Everything that you see around you has been done and coordinated and facilitated by someone sitting in that industry. And they are part and parcel of the supply chain world. And as you know, it's very time sensitive, volatile. There's a lot of third parties involved, very regulated. And, and, and unfortunately, it's not a professionalized industry. So understand these, uh, understanding all these activities, um, you really, really need a broad scope of skill to actually consult to who your customer is at the end of the day, who's doing the international trade part. So it, it really is, has become a sector. In the transport sector, so freight forwarding and customs within the transport sector, that, is, that has outgrown the pace of the skills growth. And that is also due to the, the misalignment or the possible misalignment, should I rather say, um, with inaccurate guidance 
uh, that where the sector skills plans from the from the transport theatre comes in. So there's not an alignment from the sector education training authority leading to building a a stronger professionalised um, uh, uh, l- larger professional industry in the freight forwarding sector. So what do I want to achieve? I want to, to develop um, accurate skills plans for improved capacity building in the freight forwarding and clearing industry um, as part of the transport sector in order to build those professional uh, professional communities uh, for the future. So it is, it is the, the problem is really is that for a prominent sector like this, the capacity building is left behind. Simple as that. And um, the levy skills levy players, uh, levy payers in the skills development sector are paying towards their sector. And the freight forwarding and clearing sector is a subsector of the transport sector, which means that sector is left behind. There's a misalignment of where does that need to go? Where does that, um, the funding and the development actually need to go? So in terms of the background, I mean, in post-1994, uh, the ANC really have since developed uh, the policies to correct the wrongs of the past. So this is where it came from. Education and skills development um, was one of them. And it's really been alluded, uh, to, or, well, uh, rather aiming from the NSDS, alluded into a skills development act where skills development levies to be paid, um, where those levies are distributed or should be distributed through the CETA authorities um, to actually uh, accommodate the initiatives and learning and skills development strategies for the certain sector. So, um, in terms of of just from my point of view, uh, and and all now I want to say my point of view, my my experience is that um, there is certain compliance that needs to take place, and this is be completely overshadowed, uh, and in 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 and as a primary concern where it became a tick box tick box exercise skills and training and education has been left behind. And the concerns are really is when the sector skills plan is created from a sector point of view, there is ineffective methodologies used to collect the data to feed this SSP, the sector skills plan, resulting in misaligned and inaccurate guidance to improve capacity building in the sector. So drawing from my experience, I propose to delve into those challenges. Uh, facing that mismatch um, and trying to understand where this mismatch comes from and really going and approach it from a grounded theory point of view and saturating as many ideas and as many information as possible and experiences and, and conversations to, to actually fi- to, to find what are the reasons and what should we do to make it more accurate, especially for the future and especially for economic growth and and being a prominent player in the in in the uh, GDP of this country, so the study aims to answer that question: What are the contributing factors uh, in developing an accurate and workforce aligned sector skills plan, contributing to improved capacity building for the freight forwarding and clearing sector? That's obviously broken down in a few other questions, just to make it a little bit easier in terms of examining and and detailing it. Um, I don't know if I should go through that. Um, I'll talk about a little bit about my, my research plan. So it's really a, a underpinned by a subjective, inductive, and interpretive approach to answering the research question and its aim and realizing the objective. So drawing on uh, my foundational knowledge and the research theories, uh, the Vinci tips model, um, uh, the impact of the fourth industrial revolution, the fifth industrial revolution, Really, I really aim to evaluate how the development of an accurate SSP could improve um, the sector at the end of the day. So it's a dominant qualitative approach uh, with, with multiple focus groups, structure interviews, questionnaires to answer the, 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 the research questions. Um, through those subjective and qualitative methods, uh, an inductive interpretation um, would be investigated. And then definitely from a, from a humanistic uh, ontology with coupled with systems theory, uh, really looking at from that from that lens, um, almost taking the human interest and the knowledge as the core reality where it needs to to expand on. So, um, in terms of of that research, just really builds on the current realities in knowledge, 
from the qualitative data or research that, that needs to be done and reflect on sets of circumstances um, and the interaction of individuals in organization impacting on the contribution of these skills plans. So I would like to make sense of these data that's collected through the focus groups and interviews and descriptive surveys to formulate theories and, and conceptual framework. And the target population would therefore be the freight forwarding chamber uh, within the transport seater. So really going into where the SSP is developed from, the skills development facilitators that sends that data from business and from sector to complete um, workplace skills plan, human resource management, talent and transformation management, operational managers, employees, and executive leaders in the field of freight forwarding and clearing within the transport sector. So, Marla, I, I don't know if that was the introduction. <laughs> that was perfect, Juliet. So, Juliet, I'd like to ask you, so one of the key areas, obviously, of a doctorate is um, the contribution of new knowledge. And I get that you want to, um, I, I totally understand what you want to look at. But if I were to say to you in one sentence or in, um, you know, in one sentence, what do you think your unique contribution will be? Um, I think uh, also taken maybe from, from my previous studies uh, in my master's, and it translates definitely into this one, is, the, is, the, is the, the, how do we actually, um, uh, I almost want to say, extrapolate the skills of the future uh, in terms of more practical, more simulated, more experiential, um, because this is a complex environment. And mm -hmm. yet we are training simple things. Or curriculums are are still designed, or it's, it was designed for the now, and maybe still even five years previous. Uh, although some of those things are relevant, I think my contribution would be: what are we doing differently for the future skills? You know, we 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 speak about it, but we don't we don't put new curriculums together. It takes five years to get there, and then the five years are done, and then so we have to actually. Do you intend doing a framework, a model, um, a new curriculum design, you know, a design framework or a plan in terms of what, because you spoke about the skills plan, but I'm saying, um, do you intend to come up with new key concepts? So I'm just trying to grapple a little bit for you to remember that you have to make the shift from master's to doctorate of a unique um, knowledge contribution. So just something to keep in mind. I don't expect you to answer mm -hmm. it now, but just to keep in mind that, um, you know, providing providing certain areas, but out of that, you need to provide something that is unique and novel and new, because that is the purpose of a of a doctoral thesis. Yeah. Okay. I think I think just in terms, I can answer that. Um, just in terms of the sector that that I'm doing the study in, um, just just the emerging practice of a, a line okay. skills plan would actually be already be something unique because it hasn't been a focus. At all, the subsector okay. not spoken about. There's no, there's no um, a, a career path that that's driving it. Professional bodies does not exist yet. So, so I think that's the uniqueness that it takes because it should actually be professionalized. It should be specialized. Should be more regulated than the skill set. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Juliet. Um, I saw someone else had a comment earlier, Charles. I think it was you that you you had your hand up. Yes, it was me, um, Juliet. One of the one of the aspects um, of of our uh, education and training system that that always um, mystifies me is the fact that we don't seem to relate our education and training to South Africa's position in terms of world competitiveness. Is your study going to incorporate the possible reasons for our failing uh, world competitiveness? With the with the um, should we call it the vocational training or the occupational training um, system? Um, thanks for that question, Charles. Yes, there there would be a, a, a global comparison made. Um, I think you know at this time I've I've, I've been taught that uh, I can't have an opinion yet about if we are failing or not. Uh, all I can do is research it and put literature to the, together. But yes, um, there's definitely going to be. There is, uh, I mean, I already started on making the comparison between our local CETA, uh, our local, because that's vocational, versus what other countries are doing. 
So some countries have adopted our system and some, in some instances only some of our CETOs have adopted a, a global perspective. So, so it is, um, so definitely to, to answer your question, there would be a comparison on a global level, whether it's called what we call it, but it would be comparative. Um, the, the question was, we, we are, uh, in terms of the World Competitiveness Index, we are slowly going down, 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 down. Um, and one of the, one of the uh, reasons for that stated in, in, in the analysis is the fact that the, um, the, the education and training system is not adequate. So my, my question was, is your study going to address the the context of our occupational um, education and training system with our falling possible reasons for our falling down the world competitiveness index in terms of the so in terms of the objective we are talking about trying to 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 have an accurate alignment for capacity building in this industry right so in other words i'm very much focused on that there is a portion of that comparison already made. The reasons of that absolutely will be explored because that would be part and parcel of why there's a misalignment and why our, 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 our skills gap is so big. So um, in the literature that I've already started with, one of the, I mean, I, I don't know which report you are referring to, but mine is the World Economic Forum where South Africa is rated or ranked 33rd um, in terms of the logistic professionalism, in terms of uh, skill set. So it is a topic of discussion, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Juliet, uh, James has made a comment saying, with respect to this discussion, I found deep change by Robert Quinn um, insightful. Uh, Tony, and you can just carry on reading his comments. I just saw Tony's got a question. Thanks. Um, Tony, coming from the sector, I'm interested to hear your comments, Tony. And then afterwards, um, Dr. Mecca. So mine is not so much of a question, but what I would really like to see in in reading uh, the results of what Juliet is doing is what bedevils uh, our industry in terms of uh, what Juliet's been saying about the our theatre and the misalignment of things is that we've struggled hard as um, individual isolated uh, nodes in the industry. Uh, to come up with the usage of OFO codes, and I guess uh, Juliet will explain what that means a bit later, um, but what happens is that each industry and each skills development facilitator and each company chooses an OFO code that they think is relevant to uh, populate the WSP and therefore the ATRs and therefore the, the DG applications. So if you're looking for um, an OFA code for logistics manager, there are many, many uh, logistics managers. And a popular one that was used a couple of years ago uh, was logistics manager. But if you looked at the specializations, it was logistics in transporting maize from farmers to the silos. <laughs> so let's pretend that now we've been using that OFA code in our WSPs. So the theatre, our theatre, looks at that OFO code and says, ah, oh, this is the popular um, um, uh, learnership or now occupational qualification that we ought to be funding. But another um, person or in, a, in one of the other nodes might have a different OFO code and then it's seen as a scarce skill, but it's not necessarily true. So I would love to see a little bit of leadership that maybe Juliet could influence and, and to recommend that the theatre with its stakeholders come up with a agreed guideline per chamber. So the forwarding and clearing chamber, this is the OFO code for logistics manager in your industry, which is then related to international trade. Uh, for road transport, the logistics manager. This is the OFO code for the for the guy that uh, schedules trucks. Uh, for the logistics manager in in rail, the OFO code is this one. And because we all know that phrase, junk in, junk out. And I think that contributes to the misalignment. And if there was a little bit of leadership taken on that, 
and uh, I don't know how Juliet would, would think of it and putting it into her recommendations. That for me would be unique and new because it would be a little bit of a leadership uh, taken by the theatre to guide people as to what would be the OFO codes. And if there was something uh, missing, which we've brought to the attention of, of, of theatre a couple of times, uh, because the OFO codes are an international uh, OFO code listing. So it can't just be changed uh, at a theatre level. It's got to go through a national forum and then an international forum. So there is a process behind that, but uh, we need some leadership in the uh, public uh, learning space that's allocated to South Africa to add to this range, this palette of OFO titles that are relevant to the specific nodes of our industry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, Juliet, before you comment and we go on to Dr. Mecca, just um, Mashabani Ledwaba from the theatre commented um, that I'm here from the theatre. We're really looking forward to Juliet's findings as the CETA. We've not been able to have a thorough or in-depth research in our subsection to determine future skills needs. Um, and the findings on Juliet's research will map a way forward for us in the FNC subsector and add value to our SSP. So I want to thank the theatre for firstly joining and also the comment, because I think that is very critical, Juliet, as part of a doctoral study, to know that from a quadruple helices perspective, we've got the education aspect covered, the governmental, the industry um, aspect covered as well. And so I think from that perspective, to gain that support is really a validation that your study is on the right path. Um, Brian's put a comment, but I just want to let um, Tony, I'll come back to you. But um, if uh, Dr. Emeka has had his hand up, if he could comment. And then afterwards, Tony, you can continue. And just to add to that, um, what Juliette was saying about the, the new industrial revolutions and forward thinking. Now, we're completely restrained because the OFO codes talk about current models of, of jobs. Um, so there's no OFO code that, that, that's been developed to say, use this code when you're talking about something in the future that doesn't exist now. However, the theatre can only fund curricular development and fund if it's got an OFO code. So we're absolutely stuck. We cannot develop curricula because there is no OFO code and we can't get funding for the development of the curricula because of the same reason. So that OFO code for me is a very pivotal thing to think about in terms of un unleashing the possibilities for the development of curricula in a world that we don't know where we're going to. I know it sounds odd to say, is there a career about a career that we don't know and can we develop an OFO code? But that's the only way that's going to unlock the funding and therefore the curricular development. So I think it's important with um, curriculum development to also remember to keep things um, I understand what you're saying, Tony, but to try broaden things in terms of speaking to, say, industrial revolutions, etc. cetera. Um, Dr. Mecca, I see you back. Um, and then, Juliet, will you just have a look at Brian and Charles's comments um, so that you can also see. Dr. Mecca, feel free to speak. Thank you for your research area. I think it's a good place to, to research. Um, what I want to... What I, what I want to get to your knowledge is, uh, or my comment here is, uh, I guess you should be able to uh, um, discuss what you have found in literature on this, uh, this subject, and uh, discuss the gap that is there, and also discuss uh, what you, what, uh, where your research is going to fill that gap. Uh, that is, uh, I believe, what is the procedure in a PhD thesis. So, uh, should be able to find what is a, a discussed exhaustively what is there in literature, then the gap that is there and what you are going to contribute to it. Now, now that you are talking about South African experience, I believe you are going to talk about uh, the supply chain management in South Africa, the procurement aspect of it. And um, you can see that uh, if you are going to develop something that is uh, maybe a procurement and the supply chain management and procurement framework, you, you, you got to like deal with it, you got to maybe, you would have to address the corruption that is in the procurement system in South Africa. And how the, the new system you are going to develop is going to address this corruption, okay? And um, I guess when you're talking about the professionalism in supply chain management, are, are, you, are, you, are you suggesting that professionalism is perhaps going to 
take care of uh, address or address all these uh, problems in the South African supply chain management uh, situation. You know, so I don't. Uh, I, I think you are dealing with uh, a very important issue, uh, uh, but I don't know how you're going to. These are issues I believe you are go also going to also going to deal with. You know, so. Um, your work is something that I, I guess I might want to read in the course of time, you know what I mean? So, uh, but I'm just trying to raise these points so that you can, you know, take care of them. In the, uh, uh, of course, you have to position your work in some, some kind of um, a theoretical framework, you know? There has to be some kind of a theory behind it. You know, that theory is uh, like the spirit of the work. It is, it is what distinguishes the master's, your PhD from the master's degree they've done already. Then, then you can work with that, okay. So that's what I, I can say for now. You know, I wish maybe in the course of time your work could be discussed again. Maybe you can have a look into it. Thank you so so much for that comment. I think uh, corruption is definitely something that um, I almost want to say. I don't want to say close to our heart, but it's definitely something that we all are very worried about, and especially in in, in the procurement space. So. Um, for now, I'm going to focus more on the freight forwarding and, and, and clearing space, which is also very regulated. And I see that Brian has mentioned cross-border. I mean, there's also a lot of corruption taking place. And Charles's uh, comment is the lack of competence throughout the industry does provide a huge barrier to trade. So when those things are more professionalized, I mean, when a, a chartered accountant or an auditor or a lawyer or a medical doctor goes against their profession and their professionalization, there is, there is some, some consequences. So, and I always say, you know, uh, industry as important as this, that actually gets everything together in the world, there's no real consequence um, when there's mistakes and corruption. So, I, I, I mean, I think throughout the, throughout the literature, it might, came out, it might come out as well, but I, I, I believe one of the areas I believe that when there's education, a lot of other things come right um, in terms of ethics, in terms of governance, in terms of leadership, in terms of corruption. Um, so, so, but thanks for that. I, I, I definitely took a note and, and to see if it has a space in this study or would it have a space in a further, in a further engagement? Okay. Thank you. Um, so Dr. Lloyd's got a question, her hands also up or a comment. Dr. Lloyd? Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I think the freight forwarding and clearing industry is changing so rapidly. Um, if we just have to think of the huge increase in online shopping and online purchasing and uh, the, the dynamic around that and how the customer is experiencing it. There's a huge skills need out there. And I think that's what I hear from Juliet, part of her study, is that there's a dynamic that we are currently in sector skills plans not catching. And her study is going to be looking, if I understood it, looking at how do we grab this new dynamic um, that is happening in freight forwarding and clearing and as it is aligned in online shopping, in, in, in global movement of product where retail and wholesale is changing totally from what we knew it before and how do we align skills development with the underlying thing of reducing unemployment, et cetera, and also creating wonderful new learning and career pathways. If I understood you, Juliet, I think that's very much part also, I think, of the newness that you want to explore the, 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 and looking at the fourth and fifth IR, et cetera, et cetera, to bring that dynamic into it. I might be wrong, but I think that's what I was hearing you say. Thank you. No, um, um, Dr. Shelley, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, also, just for the audience, uh, Dr. Shelley is my supervisor, so she she has really helped me along um, the right path here. But yes, it's it, it is really what do we want to achieve? Want to achieve an accurate plan for capacity building for future leaders building a, a, a large professional industry, an industry that that's actually not seen as that professional or not seen as that important. Uh, it's always been a stepchild of, 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 of trade, um, and it is crucial that it becomes that new, new dynamic. So I think throughout the study, that dynamic would definitely be, be, be able to come out.
I think that what we need to take cognizance of when you're looking specifically at the sector skills plan is that one of its foundations is the workplace skills plan, which, which is considered to be a data resource of what training is planned. It's called a workplace skills plan. But actually, that's not what it is. It's, it's what are we going to apply to the CETA for funds for? And it doesn't reflect what we're actually going to train. For instance, uh, Juliet, you know well, coming from, from a company that used to be called UTI, um, that they, they, they have highly classified training, if I can put it that way, the way they train their salespeople, um, which is unique to them and makes them and gives them a tremendous competitive edge. And no company is going to put that in a workplace skills plan. So therefore, the workplace skills plan itself is um, is a very uh, what's the word unreliable source of data when you're trying to assess um, whether you know what what training is happening. And I wonder if you could comment on that and whether and how you're going to tackle that in your research, uh, Juliet. Thanks. Thanks, Charles. I mean, it's definitely a big portion of it uh, because I mean I've studied all 21 theatres. And everyone gets their data from the WSC and the ATR, and only a few and far between have different engagements. So that is definitely one of the contributing factors. So, I mean, one of my first questions is what factors could be identified contributing to the inaccurate development of the freight forwarding and uh, clearing skills plan? And the WSC is definitely one of that. Saying that, later in the study, we would need to make a recommendation based on the literature that, that is obviously research. So, so yes, very aware of the WSB. Thank you so much for that, Juliet, and also for your engagement. Um, I really think that it's been an amazing day today with people commenting, etc. But before I close off, I'm going to hand over to Letta to give her um, portrayal of this. And I certainly take my hat off to Letta because um, doing these engagements on the doctoral um, candidates I know is complex, Letta. So I will hand over to you to close off with that letter. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Kuhn. And I come from a learning and development background, so I understand that the ATR and the WSP rolls off the tongue easily. <laughs> All right. So, so Juliet started saying that she's passionately curious. Specifically, she's looking at developing accurate sector skills plan for the freight forwarding um, uh, supply chain. It should be an exciting career opportunity, but we need to professionalize it. It really made a, an impact to me when she said almost everything around you that you can touch has been touched by the freight forwarding um, industry. So this is this is critical. Capacity building is definitely lacking in the sector. Um, how do we ensure that that compliance doesn't just become um, a ticks box, ticks box, let me try that again, tick box exercise. The data is not being used effectively for capacity planning. We need to focus on getting those ATRs and WSP as accurate as possible so that we can have access to data to make better decisions. The, the sense that she's going to be making of the data, she's going to be involving um, the, the SDFs, the business, HR operations, various execs, as well as employees. Um, in order to get to new knowledge, what is the skills for the future that we need in this particular industry? There's also talk of comparison to make sure that South Africa's competitiveness is, is addressed and, and answering the question, why is that skills gap so wide? Um, very interesting conversation around the OFO codes. And again, uh, we need better information, better decisions or better data in order to make better decisions, because that's going to lead to us being able to unlock the funding for relevant curriculum development. The question was also made, how do we find a solution for the corruption that is unfortunately in the system? And then a final comment, we need to grab this new opportunity and grab the growth in the sector because we've just seen in the last two years how online shopping, for example, has just exploded. There's tremendous opportunity here. Um, if we don't grab it, we are going to miss that. Dr. Kunan, that is the visual summary from today. Back over to you. Later, um, I saw Juliet put a comment saying that she's going to frame this. So I assume you've captured it well, Lita. Um, so, and James, it says this is amazing creativity. So thank you very much, Lita. Much appreciated to Juliet and to L Nilesh for really engaging us and invigorating us today. I certainly feel very excited for your study and the contribution to the sector. Nilesh, you said to us at the beginning that you hope that we will not only engage, but we will also feel invigorated at the end of the session and we will feel that we've 
really opened our minds. And I think given the comments people have made, everybody feels that way. So I would like to thank Juliet, Letta and Le Nilesh, sorry, I'm getting tongue tied as well, Letta, for your remarkable contributions and really to the audience. I mean, you've been absolutely incredible. I know some of you had to drop off and, and put apologies, but you've been an incredible, engaging audience. I think you've helped Juliet immensely. Um, Nilesh, the engagement was fantastic. So have a wonderful evening and a fantastic rest of the week.